Okay, we are recording. Uh, I'm Brandon Polite, Associate Professor of Philosophy at Knox College in Galesburg, Illinois, and I'm joined once again by Hannah Kim, who is an Assistant Professor of Philosophy at McAllister College in St. Paul, Minnesota. Hannah, thanks for, so much for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Okay, so we're talking about your paper, Art, Moral Sorry, Art Beyond Morality in Metaphysics, Late Chosen Korean Aesthetics, which was uh, in a journal of aesthetics and art criticism in 2019. Uh, and in that paper, you're sort of tracing the history of Korean aesthetics and sort of coming into its own in the late 18th, or sorry, late 17th into the 18th centuries. Um, so could you talk about a bit about the history of uh, Korean aesthetics sort of starting off from very much focused on what China's doing, uh, both sort of philosophically and aesthetically uh, in terms of the theory, but also the content subject matter of, of the artworks to develop it, developing into its own thing. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's hard to talk about history of Korea without also talking about history of China because so much of their histories are kind of um, interwoven throughout the millennia. And so um, through, I should have looked up these dates, but for most of Korean history, no, let me repeat that. Um, maybe starting from 12th, 13th, 14th century, there's this political system in place between China and Korea, where China is this much bigger dynasty, you know, um, north of Korea. And they set this uh, system up called the tributary system where instead of China just unilaterally taking over the Korean Peninsula and turning it into a part of China, the Chinese dynasty is going to let the Korean dynasty be in exchange for first acknowledgement of superiority um, and also secondary yearly tributes or gifts. So that's why it's called tributary system. And this system was in place for centuries, right? And so this meant that although Korea was more or less independent politically, they had to first acknowledge China as the top dog um, and just you know, take their place as an inferior um, political agent. But this also meant that a lot of the cultural uh, frameworks were adapted and um, brought over from China. So for instance, even though spoken Korean existed for uh, millennia, we Koreans use Chinese characters even after the invention of the Korean alphabet for multiple centuries, because that was just the language that was used. Um, it's interesting in the arts too, a lot of Chinese music was imported in for Confucian ceremonies and such. Um, in painting, Korean painters wouldn't paint Korean landscapes. They would paint Chinese landscapes, even though they haven't been, or they would rather paint imaginary landscapes than paint their own Korean landscapes. So there is this um, strong cultural influence and I think aesthetic framework and values that were imported in from China. And so that was where um, I started digging into Korean aesthetics. Um, and a lot of this comes from the Confucian tradition that has a lot of emphasis on the role art plays in a good human life and especially good human moral life. Yeah, and so could you talk a bit about the Confucian attitude towards music, right? I mean, it, it, you know, we, we've sort of briefly, you know, exchanged uh, messages about this, but, you know, it sort of parallels the Greek, uh, ancient Greek attitude a bit that, you know, there's this way in which music reflects the nature of the universe, but it's also, you know, meant to be morally edifying and, and cultivating in the way that, you know, Plato would think about it as well. So can you talk a bit about that. Yeah. Um, by the way, James Harold has a great paper on this topic. It's called On the Ancient Idea That Music, music Shapes Character, I think. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I, music and Confucianism is actually uh, the way I got into Asian philosophy at all. And so I started reading the Analects um, and I started paying attention to how Kongzu or Confucius was talking about music. And it was just so interesting. He talked about it a lot. He talked about music being this key feature without which you can't become a perfect sage or gentleman. He talked about music being um, this uh, almost like a litmus test if they could tell you like how much virtue a person has depending on how you respond to music. 
Um, of course, ritual, which is a big deal in Confucianism, is really closely tied to music as well. And here it's not just instrumental music. Usually they mean music involving also dancers and costumes and these elaborate uh, systems that go with it. And so, um, yeah, you're right. A lot of the attitude that the Confucians had towards music is also mirrored in uh, the way the ancient Greeks thought about music. So um, we know Pythagoras talked about music called harmony being um, also mirrored on the universe, right? And so they thought the spheres had their own music that humans couldn't hear. And um, harmony has this mathematical structure, um, literally and figuratively. Um, and so there's this close connection between the forms of music and the metaphysics of reality. And so that's why music is special. Um, and something similar happens in um, ancient Chinese metaphysics too, where they thought the five notes of the pentatonic scale corresponded to the different elements that make up the universe, you know, like things like metal, earth, water, fire. Um, uh, and eventually, and so they keep this metaphysical picture between meta, uh, music and uh, the elements long enough in the 12th or 13th century, they actually come up with a scientific experiment to try to figure out how chi or like energy is related to different notes so they have this like experiment where they, where they have a big like set of pipes that they're gonna play different notes on and they have ashes just kind of floating or like on the ground. And depending on which pipes the air is like, coming through, the ash is gonna move. And that tells you where the cheese are according to different notes. It's like really fun, um, but they, they took this really seriously. Um, and so I think that connection between metaphysics and music kind of justified why music should be considered an important, serious endeavor, but also as an uh, explanation for why music is so effective for moral cultivation. And so Shenzhou, um, a, a Confucian philosopher, talks about music having this magic-like quality just to affect people, and he talks about the connection to qi. And so there's a scientific explanation for them, why music is good for moral improvement. So that's kind of the Confucian picture of uh, why music is so important and relevant to everything they're trying to do. Yeah, right. And so the Koreans also would have believed this as, as you know, sort of a tributary state is being viewed as culturally inferior. So we import these cultural products that are superior to our own and these, uh, not just cultural products, but the metaphysics that underlies them uh, and, the and the views on morality that underlies them. But then you know, I guess 17th century, 18th century, there's a shift uh, in sort of the Korean attitude towards Chinese philosophy and Chinese uh, art. And so could you talk about that? Yeah. And so now we're in the late Chosun dynasty, 17th, 18th century. Chosun dynasty is the Korean dynasty that lasted from 1392 to 1910. So it lasted quite a while. And it's the dynasty that was there before um, the Japanese colonized Korea. And so um, really exciting time, the 16th, 17th century, um, where they start to talk about wanting something that is more practical than just theoretical debates. So Neo-Confucianism was um, the orthodox school of thought in the Chosun dynasty. So actually Chosun dynasty is the only dynasty I think was explicitly founded on a philosophical system. So the chosen king was a philosopher king, literally. And so I feel like Plato would have been really happy. Um, so they took the Neo-Confucian debates really seriously. You know, they're like all doing a lot of scholarship on it. But there are these groups of philosophers, um, we call them the Shihak philosophers, which means practical learning, where they get a little disgruntled by just doing the intellectual stuff. And they say, no, like scholarship or philosophy should also be applied. And so there are these kind of inklings of wanting to go beyond the old school frameworks or values, right? So they want to do what's, what's relevant and practical, like what can we do to actually help the everyday people? And part of that, I think, just change of thought and perspective is also the, uh, related to art. And so instead of thinking about art as something that's important and justifiable because of its moral benefits or metaphysical ties, they said, no, like art is good because we enjoy it, right? So that's a really modern thought. I think that's obvious to us that art doesn't need further justification. You know, art for art's sake is a really valid reason, but this is pretty unheard of back then. Um, 
And so for the Koreans to say, no, like, you don't need to talk about music in its ties to ritual or why it's metaphysically important, but like, why don't we just think about music as something that makes life richer and that there's a charm to music that has to do with the social nature and that's good enough to justify music. And I think that really signals a kind of um, pivot, pivoting away from this old school way of valuing or thinking um, about philosophy in general, but also particularly about art. And this, I think, eventually has repercussions in other forms of art beyond music. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot to dig into there. One thing that comes to mind as you're talking, right, is that there's a shift away from viewing art or viewing music in particular as morally edifying, as having this uh, pedagogical function, as it being sort of connected to the universe and to our higher sphere and higher powers, right? And it's about enjoyment for its own sake and its its charms are the things that matter, right? And, and so that's why it's good, right? Music is good because it's charming, it's good for our lives precisely, for it enriches our lives, et cetera, right? And it sort of reminded me of Kant thinking that music is only charming, <laughs> right? Uh, it, it can't express higher human things because it lacks language basically, right? And you know, he, Kant lowers music below gardening, right? In his ranking of the arts, right? And so much so that music is barely an art if it is an art for Kant. And it's precisely because it's only charming, right? And so it's interesting that the Koreans are wanting to elevate music because it's charming, whereas, you know, a century or so later, a couple centuries later, Kant's like wanting to demote it uh, because it's it's not, because it's only charming. And then of course, Schopenhauer comes along and is like back to the Confucius, right? <laughs> Who, you know, he's influenced by um, Eastern thought. And it's like, no, 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 it does represent reality. And that's why it's the highest art. It's the ultimate representation of the will, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but I think the Kant example is really, helpful because it shows you that this was not an intuitive idea at all back then I mean it's like what do you mean arts for art's sake and what do you mean that's like a value giving thing and not a value demoting thing right and so I think yeah I didn't know about know that about Kant but I'm sure a lot of people are uh, up in arms about it <laughs> yeah no I mean Kant compares music to perfume in that and this is something I talked to Madeline Martin Seaver about on on the yeah. show uh series whatever you want to call it uh, about how, you know, it's inescapable, right? That if someone's blaring their uh, car stereo, you can't help but hear it. And so it's like a, a bad perfume that like the person is rounding the corner, you can smell them before they get there, right? And so Kant really only has negative things to say about music. And it's because he so prioritizes language, right? That poetry is at the top precisely because it is the expression of rationality. Whereas mm. music is just pleasant, charming, sounds uh and is that's all it is right yeah yeah, yeah. and so it, it yeah it gives less value to our lives than gardening does um <laughs> this gardening gives us food which is pretty good <laughs> yeah 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 at least it can give us food right yeah. um okay cool so we've got this this shift in the korean attitude uh, uh toward music but what about with respect to the other arts right so you have this shift away from China as the center of artistic practice to sort of more focusing on ordinary everyday uh, Korean concerns. So how does that get reflected in say painting or literature or any of the other arts? Yeah, great question. Um, and so the Kant bit is actually relevant here where, um, you know, we might think music doesn't have content or at least explicit content. So it's a little more limited in what you can do in terms of subject matter or kinds of attentions that can bring to particular phenomena. But, you know, novels are not like that. Um, and in some sense, painting is not like that either. And so this shift away from all things China and all things just abstract and theoretical um, gets reflected in um, painting, for instance, in the form of people actually start painting Korean landscapes. <laughs> They're just like, look, we're Korean painters. Why are we painting Chinese landscapes that we haven't even seen? And why are we like skipping over all the great stuff we have over here, right? And so that's kind of one obvious place where they start painting Korean landscapes. They start painting just the everyday lives of Korean farmers, um, you know, Korean courtesans. Um, they paint pictures that are satirical of nature. So they'll paint aristocrats 
just being hypocritical. Um, and so there's kind of that bite as well. Um, and so painting um, and subject matter becomes a little more inward looking, right? The idea was, look, we've been just looking to China for so long. Um, let's actually turn the gaze inward and think about Chosan. And so all this kind of cultural um, movement gets called Chosan Pung or Chosan Wind because all of a sudden people are swept up in wanting to just think about themselves and and do make art about themselves. And so it's a really cool kind of inward turning time. And so we see that in painting, not only in the content, but they also develop this like new style where um, they, uh, so it's ironically called true view painting, um, but it's, so it's supposed to be um, painting that truly captures what something is like, but it's not a realist painting at all, um, where they have really exaggerated landscapes where there's like a thousand mountain peaks all packed into one frame or really jagged lines, or really just harsh brush strokes. Um, and these are really new and kind of expressive ways. And it's interesting that it's titled True View Painting because they thought, no, this is what's true because it's truly how the artist felt. And so that it's also like an inward turning thing again, right? Um, and so that's like a new style that arises. Um, I wish I had examples to show you, um, but yeah, you can look it up. If you if you Google True View Painting Korea, you'll see some examples of really extreme mountain peaks that come up. Um, and just and really quickly in, uh, in the uh, field of literature too. So we get the first novel written in the Korean alphabet which is kind of like a Korean Robin Hood story. It's really fun, kind of um, got fantasy elements as well because this guy has magical powers. Um, and so we get that first novel. We get novels written not only about the everyday lives of people, but a lot of novels with uh, satirical aims. So a lot of them will uh, just call the aristocrats out for exploiting the everyday people. And they don't pay taxes, even though they're the ones that have the most wealth. And so... Um, those are how some of the pivoting away from the old stuff gets manifested in terms of art forms. That's interesting, right? The sort of pivoting away from the old to focus on the present. And it's interesting that the true in true view has to do with the truth of the individual, right? In their experience, rather than anything out there in the world, independently of the particular perspective of the artist. And so, you know, that's very much a shift away from the Confucian attitude, which is very much, I mean, with music, it's, you know, Confucius is trying to go back to music that was for him ancient, right? That yeah. that is the best form of music is the stuff from 500, a thousand years ago, whatever. And so we're going to capture that uh, again and bring that back because, you know, Confucius is very much, or Confucianism is very much backwards looking, right? Whereas now, you know, in the uh, late Chosun period, right, in Korea, it's very much inward looking and present focused, right? We're, we're here in the now, let's focus on the now, let's focus on the lives of ordinary people right now of, you know, satirizing the politicians of the day uh, and um, uh, expressing our own identities, right? Uh, whereas before it was just identity expression was not really a, a concern, right? Right, yeah, I mean, so put in that way, it feels so modern and it, yeah, and I always worry that because it feels so obvious to us today, we don't really realize how radical it was back then. Um, but I try to imagine just, it's the first time that Koreans are talking about themselves and it's pretty cool um, that like, this is the moment where it's happening. And I mean, another historical context that's relevant here is this is when, um, the West is making contact with East Asia, right? So Matteo Ricci is in China and he's telling China about Europe. And so um, Korea also learns about, uh, they get a handle on the map of the world, right? And so once they see like how big the world is and there's like a whole ass continent they haven't seen. Um, and they're just like these people with different languages and customs and different ways of making stuff. Um, they realize like, wait, we were told that China is the center of the universe. Um, so literally China um, is, means middle kingdom because it's the center of the world, right? And so that's how we thought, but like, wait, like China's just one of many others. Um, there are a lot of other ones that are even bigger. And so if China is no longer the center, 
then maybe we can do a lot of rethinking in our orientation to the world and of ourselves. And so that's a really exciting time too, where they do a lot of rethinking about values and frameworks and um, how they understand themselves in the world. So that's also relevant historical context at this point. Yeah, right. And you mentioned how, you know, the self-expression, the political satire is very modern, right? This is happening at the same time during what we call the modern period in, in Western thought, right? Uh, and it's very much sort of a shift away from the Catholic Church being the center of everything and toward a more Protestant uh, mm -hmm. Europe where it is much more self-focused, right? That I can have mm -hmm a direct relationship with God that isn't facilitated by my relationship to a priest, which then goes up to a bishop, then an archbishop, then the pope, right? It doesn't have to go up the, the proper hierarchy. It's no, 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 I have a one-to-one -one relationship with, with God. Um, and so the, the self very much gets centered. And so it's interesting that those sort of parallel shifts are happening in the West and then Korea or Europe uh, and, and Korea at the same time. And it's also happening at this moment of, cultural exchange between the, you know, Europe and, and Korea. So that's really cool. Yeah. Interesting parallel. Yeah, it's, yeah. This happens in history where like really similar things happen seemingly independently. It's like, whoa, humans. <laughs> yeah, we're weird um, and cool and awesome. Um, so so uh, how then does what's happening during the late Chosun period relate to what's going on today in Korea, where sort of Korea is becoming a major player in culture, right? In, in film, uh, in television, uh, in pop music uh, and so forth. So how, what's sort of the connected tissue from what's going on in the late 17th, early 18th century to today? Yeah, I mean, that's a Great question. There are like scholars who are like working on exactly this topic. Um, yeah, and I, it's a question I ask myself, like, given what I know about the history of Korean thought and just Korean philosophy and Korean aesthetics, what do I think about this kind of global phenomena today of K-pop, you know, K-movies, K-drama? Um, I mean, and, and one strand that I pick up from both the history of just Korean um, intellectual history and Korean art nowadays is um, this attention to how uh, Koreans are really adaptable. So they maybe in virtue of having had to um, insist on their small like national identity while surrounded by bigger countries, they um, Koreans are especially good at importing what's foreign and then tweaking it to make it their own. Right? And so people talk about this a lot in terms of K-pop, for instance, where a lot of the early influences um, were from uh, from either like rock music from the US or uh, electronic music from Europe or even music from Japan. But in a couple of decades, they turned it into something uniquely Korean and now it's K-pop and you can um, trace the lineages of influences, but there's been this uh, almost like alchemy like transformation. And so people say that's like something that's um, uh, an example of uh, a trend that you can find both in Korean art, but also Korean um, just philosophy. So you see this a lot in neo-confusionism, I think, when you think about the way Koreans import a lot of the frameworks of uh, neo-confusionism, but they have their own debates and their own ways of understanding things, and it produces new knowledge. Um, so I think that's one trend that we might be able to find consistent um, from the late Chosun to k-pop and k-movies now although it's also interesting because now i'm thinking of uh this interview that director bong jun ho gave and at some point he says um i was really surprised that people love my movies because i thought i was expressing a very korean sentiment very korean complaints about you know if you are not one of the wealthy then it's really hard to make it and um but the entire world loves his movies and then he realized oh maybe we all live in the same country and that country is called late stage capitalism, right? And so this idea that, and I think, I don't think this is a new idea here, but just this idea that a lot of times the best way to touch a universal chord is to talk about a very particular thing, right? Like by being honest about the Korean struggle, you can also 
just relate to other places, other people who have similar sentiments. And so that's been an interesting trend too, where by talking about the Korean, there are ways to talk about the universal. Yeah, right. And with him in particular, right, sort of criticizing corruption uh, in the Korean government is, you know, government corruption is universal, right? right the yeah. themes in, in, say, The Host or in Snowpiercer or Akja, right? Um, these are universal themes, right? I mean, the, the latter two have, uh, you know, in addition to Korean actors, uh, you know, non-Korean uh, actors, American and, and European actors. Um, but yeah, these are universal themes he's hitting on, right? And so the, the problems that he's addressing in say the, the host, which is very much about, um, you know, government corruption, but also family, uh, also, you know, hunger being a central theme in the film or, uh, you know, the way in which the, the government's in cahoots with the media and, uh, the relationship between the United States and South Korea, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, these are universal themes, right? Uh, I mean, yeah. being expressed in a very particular way. And so, yeah, I think that that's really interesting, right? So there's a shift then, I guess, from uh, sort of Koreans making art about China for themselves to making art about ourselves for ourselves Mm. to making art for ourselves or about ourselves that's now for the world, right? Mm. Uh, I love and sort that. Of, you know, maybe the shift in, um, uh, yeah, maybe the shift in, um, you know, Bong Joon-ho, uh, this, this sort of shift from focusing on Korea to now I have an international cast and crew, right, mm. is sort of a, a recognition of, oh, no, no, no like we are connected to the world, that we're all dealing with the same sort of things. And, you know, then you get, you know, Squid Game being, you know, number yeah. one on, on Netflix, which is very much a Korean thing. And yet it is reflective of these broader concerns of late stage capitalism, essentially. Yeah. And it's, yeah, I love the way you put it, that there's these kind of two pivots going on. First is to pivot from like China to inside Korea for us, about us. And then now it's, yeah, sure, in some sense about us, but really more for others and about others too. And I mean, and there's a historical kind of context in this later pivot too, right? Which just increased globalization and social media and connecting is so much easier now. And um, yeah, I think that's interesting that as more connection is happening, there are also these changes and for whom and, and about what art is being made. Yeah, right. And um yeah, I mean, also with with the recent stuff, I mean, there, there's no way to think about it without thinking about the consequences of the Korean War, right? And the, the separation of the Korean Peninsula into two states, one very much global, a part of the global economy, the cultural economy, and so forth. And then the North, which is very much focused on itself, it, but sort of its relationship to China and I guess maybe Russia as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm so glad you brought it up. This is why I have a bit of a research line right now, North Korean philosophy and North Korean aesthetics. Um, just because, yeah, the trend from Cholson could be also, yeah, traced to North Korean thought. And it's, actually interesting because you know we mentioned uh, you know the Joseon dynasty how they wanted to you know they're kind of locked into this political system they can't opt out um but they wanted to like at least culturally like uh, assert their own independence um and so in a way North Korea is a step further than that where they want to say actually we want to even assert political independence because as long as Korea has been dependent or connected to some other power, you know, mostly China, but also Japan during colonialism, that's when Korea got screwed over. So our like number one goal is going to be autonomy. And so that is just the state ideology of North Korea. It's called Juche, um, literally translated into subjectivity, but people translate it into self-reliance. And so that's kind of their end all be all ideal. Um, and so, you see how that's one way of trying to extend this uh, pivot 
away from China to ourselves, but now we also want political autonomy. But now you see a country who's in every decision is geared towards how do we make sure we are not dependent on anyone else. Um, and, and so my question that follows is, well, how does this affect art and art making? Like, who do you make art about at that point and for what? Um, and it's hard because what's the division between propaganda and art? But I think that's an unfair question in some sense. Um, if only because do we draw the line between, I don't know, art and advertisement here? And I bring in advertisement because the Korean word for propaganda that North Koreans use is sunjun, which just directly translates to advertisement. And so um, anyway, that's my tangent about North Korean stuff, just because you mentioned a division. But yeah, there's a lot to be done there too. Yeah, cool. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about with respect to contemporary Korean aesthetics? Um, I don't think so. Maybe a gripe about how translation needs to be better, but that would be a whole different conversation. <laughs> so translation and, and so literally like translation and like from film into English, basically. Yeah, so yeah, subtitles in films yeah. is one thing. And so this really came up during the Squid Games issue, but this is an issue I talked about um, uh, with uh, Minari elsewhere, where just even slight uh, mistranslations really do a lot to kind of undermine the overall effect. Um, but I have a piece coming out on this with uh, Aesthetics for Birds soon. Um, but yeah, I will not indulge that uh, rant okay. right now. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so let's be on the lookout for that in Aesthetics for Birds. And also there's going to be a symposium uh, in the Journal of Aesthetics and our criticism on Korean aesthetics that you'll be a part of. Yeah, that's right. Um, summer 2022, uh, Journal of Aesthetics and Art Criticism. There'll be a symposium on Korean aesthetics. Awesome. So I'm looking forward to that. And I'm sure others, many others are as well. Um, so Hannah, thanks so much for joining me. This is a really great discussion. Yeah, thanks for having me.